First of all, welcome. Can I just say, we're like as big as Aussies in Kansas City yet. Mm -hmm. Woo! Yeah. So we spoke at Global Entrepreneurship Week. Three times the size of this. A bunch of people signed up and 12 people showed up. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. I wrote a blog post about it called What's Speaking at GEW, talking about modern mindfulness. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know how that turned out? <laughs> it's on LinkedIn and Medium. Okay. This is going to be so fun, I hope. <laughs> I used to be in the wine business and pour wine for people, whether it was 10 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night, so this is a little bit of a new gig for me. I'm sorry. I actually work in wine into my presentation, but it's Kaufman, it's early, it's Kansas, I don't know, Kansas City, sorry. So sorry about the wine, lack thereof. All right, so we're going to get started. I'm Gail Spangler, and I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Posify. And quite simply, I teach modern mindfulness and emotional intelligence for busy people. So I don't know if there's any busy people in here, but that's who, that's who I love to talk to. <clears throat> and today we're really just going to specifically talk about just some basic principles about mindfulness. What is it? What isn't it? Why should you care? But really from a business van vantage point, um, how can I perhaps use some of these techniques and practices in my real work life and in my real life? I mean, that's really all this is. So let's get started. <clears throat> First of all, I wanna make it really, really clear that nobody here, meaning me, talking about mindfulness, is here to hack your hustle. Nobody gonna take away your hustle. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Gary Vee. I don't know if anybody in here follows him, but I've been following Gary for 10 years. He was also in the wine business. Just wanted to let you show that. He was a thirsty girl for one day, and that was my previous company. So I met Gary, and um, but I've watched him for 10 years, and you know, he's really kind of, he still talks about working hard and how to, ha how to hustle and how to hack your hustle, and I think his latest book is Crushing It. But he's moved into talking about kindness and authenticity and to be honest with you it's mindfulness he really talks about that every day and I don't know about you but you can't avoid him he's on every social platform known to man so this is not that um, just to give you a little background about me and kind of being an ex-hustler I uh, I guess my third side, side hustle when, when I, was when I was nine years old. And most people's first side hustle is like the lemonade stand or something. Well, I was living in Edinburgh, Scotland. So we didn't do lemonade stands there, but I got to work in my grandmother's um, nursing home and I would hustle the little old ladies with cups of tea and they would give me chocolate biscuits. So that was when I realized, hey, you know, you do something nice or you do something and someone will give you something and I'm still paying for it now. But <laughs> um, this is a little bit of just my work hustle story. So after I came back to the States and I went to college in the Midwest, um, I moved to California and I started a job in the hustler's dream field, advertising. So I worked, from some, I worked for some notable ad agencies like Gray and Hal Reine, Austin Knight, and I got to work on some really great accounts, everything from Apple to Visa. I was hustling all the time. You know, clients can be kind of demand demanding, and I don't think that's really changed much, has it? And then I went into working from advertising after I got laid off, probably my second or third time, to wine country PR. Now, that doesn't really sound like a very stressful job, but I got to tell you, taking people around from around the world, eating and drinking and, you know, making sure they have a good time, there's, there's actually quite a bit of stress to that, but it was a dream job. And then that led to me working for the New York Times. And that was at the time when they were starting some lifestyle online magazines and I got to um, work with a startup within the New York Times called winetoday.com. That was the best ever. But again, you know, we were working 80 hours a week because this was at the advent of the internet. And that led me to my own company called Thirsty Girl. I know, Thirsty Girl. It was a multimedia company and we basically taught women how to appreciate um, wine education for women and wine appreciation. And I kind of worked with the Rachel Way of Wine. Rachel Way of wine. 
Rachel Ray of Wine. And that took us to the Oprah show, going on tour with her, the Today Show, doing books, and that whole kind of lifestyle celebrity angle. So I was stressed out, freaked out, and burnt out most of the time. So that's kind of my hustle story, just to let you know. Um, switching gears now, um, I started meditating, and here's here's some of the things that I found that nobody really wants to talk about in terms of entrepreneurship and stress. I mean, look at these numbers. 45% of entrepreneurs report to be stressed. Does that surprise anybody in the room? I think it's probably more like, it feels more like 100% some of the time. I mean, closer to 100%. I think that's a conservative number. One in three, one in three of us live with depression compared to the national average of 7%. Again, that seems a little low as well, but. And this one we all know, 90% of businesses fail within the first few years. Uh, I'm a fallout of that. Um, my business was five years to its end. And so the bottom line is there's a lot of stress in the community, and I don't think I need to tell anybody else in the room, but it's kind of interesting to see that. So with that in mind, I want to jump into our first mini mindfulness exercise, if you would. We're just going to breathe together. Don't get too excited. All right, so I would suggest that you sit up in your chair a little bit, and all we're going to do is we're going to take in a deep breath for three counts. We're going to hold it at the top for three counts, and we're going to let it go for six. So you meditators, lead the way. Let's breathe. Three. Hold it for three. Let it go. Let's do it again. Breathe in. Big. Hold. Let it go. Let's do it one more time. Breathe in. Hold. Let it go. How do you feel? Anybody feel better? Anybody feel weird breathing in a, with a bunch of strangers with their eyes closed? <laughs> I don't. I do it all the time. Which brings me to just this is my little pause button that mindfulness and meditation and emotional intelligence I, i'm not up here to say i'm going to say a lot of good things about it but i'm not up here to say this is a panacea for life for world problems it may not make your business successful overnight but it's sure a business tool that if i can just open the door a little bit for you and have you maybe walk into it as something you might consider adopting that's what i'm here for but it's definitely not a panacea so and it's not a, it's not a um, replacement for you know actual medical professional help i am not a licensed therapist i am not um, a part of the medical community so meditate at your own risk all right so what exactly is mindfulness well i'd rather talk first about what it's not and Let's start with the mindfulness and emotional intelligence that I'm talking about here today for the business community, people like yourselves. We're not talking about religion. There's no religion or secular uh, discussion. I mean, could would it be fun to talk about Buddha and the Dalai Lama and bells? Sure, but that's not what we're going to be talking about. And the second thing is mindfulness is not about emptying your mind. I don't know if anyone thinks I've got to empty my mind, but that's not what it's about. It's not necessarily about achieving relaxation. Although Nick was doing, our camera guy was doing a little quick meditation with me and he said he felt totally relaxed. So that can be a great byproduct. Um, it's again, not a quick fix. It's not a quick fix for any mental or illnesses that you may have, but again, it's a tool. And I love to say this, mindfulness is not the same as yoga. Although being an eight year yoga practitioner, practitioner Yoga, I think, is a gateway drug to mindfulness. Does anyone know why? Does anyone practice yoga here? So what do you do at the end? So you do your breathing and your, your focused breathing through your practice, but what do you do at the end? Shavasana. What's your favorite part? Shavasana. That's, that's meditation. Um, all right, so but what is it? So the classic definition of mindfulness is really just knowing what's happening in your head and I'm gonna argue your body at any given moment without getting carried away by thoughts. And here's the key, without judging yourself. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. I call it being productively introspective. I mean, that's my new business term. 
be pro wouldn't you like to be more productively introspective? Sure. A few more helpful terms as you get into this topic, as I got into the topic. So what's the difference between mindfulness and meditation? I think there's so much talk about this that people use those terms interchangeably, which is totally fine. I think I use them interchangeably, but mindfulness is how we just defined it. It's kind of knowing where you are in the present moment, right now. So it's, it's kind of like a lifestyle. It's a, it's a lifestyle. Meditation, on the other hand, is an actual mental training tool. When you meditate, you're mentally training the mind, and so it's a tool. I don't know, does that make, make, make sense? Secular, we talked about, um, that just means there's no religious affiliations, even though mindfulness and meditation comes from, is 2,600 years old, come from Buddhism and Hindu traditions, and it's just been brought over to the West, actually in um, the late 70s by a whole bunch of students that are now sort of the leaders of modern mindfulness. Um, rumination. I had to look this word up, although I did it all the time. Do you know what rumination is? I shouldn't have said that to my boss in that meeting. He's going to think I'm an idiot. And you ruminate on that thought, maybe for an hour, maybe for a day, maybe for a week. When you have those thoughts, and they tend to be negative over and over and over, my dog's going to die, my dog's a puppy, you know, my cat's going to die, all of that is rumination. Um, and the opposite of rumination is something that, again, a word I had to look up, equanimity. Equanimity is kind of the opposite of rumination, right? It's being more balanced, even more focused, and just... I hate to use the word Zen, but it's being a little bit more Zen, whether it's business dealings or how you feel inside yourself. So it's kind of the opposite. It's a good thing. Self-awareness, that's a whole topic on itself. Um, but self-awareness is a little bit more than just, oh, I think I know myself. It's a lot about knowing yourself internally, externally, your strengths, your weaknesses, how are you perceived, how are you not perceived. So. Um, Self-awareness is really the key, I think, to all of this stuff. Key to mindfulness, it's the key to meditation. And again, anytime I can do some self-awareness training, I'm all about that. And then beginner's mind. Um, I just want to introduce that. Beginner's mind is that curiosity. You know, when you came out of the womb, you didn't know anything. You looked at everything with, a new, with new eyes. And that's what we call in the mindfulness world, beginner's minds. You became a toddler, you know, you felt the grass, you saw bubbles for the first time. I think we as adults, you know, we lose that beginner's minds as we get, as we just go through life. Um, so let's do a little exercise that's gonna help us get this back. And that's where the chocolate comes in. So if you would mind, sorry, I have someone to help. Um, pass the chocolate quickly. We're gonna do a beginner's mind chocolate tasting. Disclaimer, there may be some nuts in these things, so if you're allergic, I probably would opt out. Just pass it down, and all I ask you to do is not to get the chocolate. <laughs> and if you want, if you eat the chocolate and you want some more later, that's fine. But we're gonna taste this chocolate together with a beginner's mind, and we're gonna do it like we have never had chocolate in our life. So let's, let's do that. How's the passing going? Awesome. Let me know when everybody has some chocolate. Pass behind. I know it's hard not to unwrap it. Don't unwrap it yet. This may be a little painful for some of us. Almost there. Back row. Hope you got the flavor you liked. Don't ask me what they are. All right, so let's look at that shiny foil on our chocolate together. Just look at it like you've never seen gold or purple or orange or, wow, it's kind of cool. And let's flip over our chocolate and see, oh, there's some crinkly stuff on the back. All right. So go ahead and let's 
unwrap our package. Just noticing the, oh, I can hear the paper crinkling and take a look and is it a different color on the inside? I had some people that were ripping into that chocolate. <laughs> you guys are very mindful. And you can, yeah, I like it. You're flattening out your paper and maybe pick up your chocolate now and notice the color, the texture. Sorry, is it melting? You can lick your fingers, I guess. Notice the color and the texture and, you know, is there a little indentation on there? Okay, awesome. Now let's put it up to our nose and give it a big sniff. I don't know what chocolate smells like, but this is really good. Okay, I'm gonna ask you to pop it in your mouth, but don't chew it. Just pop it in there. Try not to chew. And let it roll around a little bit. Remember, you've never tasted chocolate before. Did you get milk chocolate, dark chocolate? Oh, I don't know, I don't know what that is. Feel the texture, maybe you're salivating a little bit more. All right, go ahead and bite into the chocolate. Sir, I saw that chewing. Bite. Okay, go ahead and chew it, chew it all up. So, I guess it's very simple, but the question is, did you enjoy that chocolate? Maybe a little bit more than just movie, Netflix, chocolate? <laughs> if we can approach life a little bit more like this, that's mindfulness. All right, awesome. All right, my favorite part, common myths why people don't meditate. And I know we've got some people who do practice, but let's go through these. First of all, you do not have to have a hipster cat. That's the number one thing. I stole this from Dan Harris of 10% Happier. He uses this cat in his presentation. So the number one myth for everyone, me, you, everyone, I don't have time. I used to say, really? But you know what? It's kind of true. I don't have time. Um, I don't know if anybody in this room follows Tim Ferriss, but I kind of, when I saw this quote, I kind of liked it. So I thought, I'm going to use it. I'm going to shame you a little bit. If you don't have time, the truth is, maybe you're just not making a priority. And isn't that what we all do? I clearly don't make going to the gym a priority. I used to back in the day, but I fell off the wagon and I just don't make it a priority. It's the same thing with anything, but let's see if we can revisit that. So here's what I've got to tell you, the first hack. You don't have to meditate for 30 minutes a day, on a cushion, on a mountain, cross-legged, with your hipster cat, whatever. You can actually get in what we call mindfulness micro practices in your everyday life. And I know this sounds really simplistic, but I'm gonna take, I'm gonna make an assumption that pretty much everybody here brushes their teeth sometime, takes a shower, goes and gets coffee, commutes to work, and probably walks to get somewhere. While you are doing all these everyday mundane activities that you ha obviously have time for, you can be getting in a mindfulness practice. So let's just take brushing your teeth. You're brushing your teeth, you got the mirror, you're going, oh, my hair's I got a bad hair day. I gotta pick up the kids. Uh, I got a meeting with the boss, I might be late. That's all busy mind and what most of us do. But instead, what if you brushed your teeth and actually brushed your teeth? You felt the brush, you swished the water around, you really just focused your attention on that top, on that um, activity. You know when you are in the shower and most people say, I get my best ideas in the shower. Does that, has that ever happened? I mean, that's happened to everybody, right? It's because you kind of are letting your mind go with that flow of the water and that's another byproduct of mindfulness is creativity and flow. So anyway, micro practices. Just, that's the first takeaway. People will think I'm weird. Well, guess what? Some people will. So I don't know if you know this guy. Everybody knows LeBron. He is a huge meditator and nobody thinks he's weird. And you know why he meditates the hell out of, he, he is such a priority, but do you know why? Three points, baby, all day long. So LeBron James, Michael Jordan, Phil Jackson, these guys, you know, they've learned that mindfulness in what they do is really part of their, you know, how they enhance their performance. So next time someone says you're weird, think about LB. So here's the thing I wanna just leave you with. Yeah, people might think you're weird, but it's a lifestyle that, if you think about it, change your mindset. It gives me an edge. It can give me an edge. Not take it away. 
And the more you do it, here's the good byproduct, the less you care what people think. This is key for me. Um, or you can tell me you're in ninja modes, or you can wear your sunglasses, whatever. But the point is, let's not get hung up on that. Now this one, I can't relate to as much, but maybe you can. I don't deserve this time. It's like kind of like going to the spa. I'm gonna relax and you know shut the door or take time away from my family or my kids or my activity or whatever. But <clears throat> I had this dated photo up here, but it's the best one I could find. <laughs> It's like you've got to take care of yourself. So when you're in the airline, you know, when you're in the airplane and the masks come down, it's never happened, but if it ever did, you put your mask on first so you can help the person next to you. So that's kind of like the prioritization about mindfulness. I mean, you can exercise right, you can brush your teeth, you can exercise. Are those self indulgences or are those self care? So again, just a little mindfulness switch, toggle in your brain. Um, and again, you just did the 336 exercise. So the next time you think, ah, this doesn't do anything for me, take a breath. Okay. I hear this one from my friends all the time, but Gail, I'm too, I'm too busy to, to meditate. That's the first one. And the second one is my mind is racing. I have so much on my mind. I can't turn my mind off. And I, I don't know if I can say, oh, I, don't, I definitely can't say it now, but I say you really need to meditate. So here's the thing. Meditation is not about turning off your brain. We're humans. I don't think our brains actually turn off until, we're, until we die. So here's some hacks to get out of your own way or to get out of your own head. The obvious one is take a break, take a walk, go in nature, take a breath outside the door. I mean, focus on something else. And when you do that walk or that break, don't take your phone, don't have your notifications on, don't do your to-do list. And maybe when you're taking that break, here's the best thing. Talk to someone you've never talked to before. Talk to a stranger. Yeah, I'm that weird person who talks to you in Starbucks line sometimes. Just depends on if your headphones are on or not. Mm -hmm. And here's the even better thing. Ask an inappropriate question. In other words, be curious. Be human. Okay, focus on something else. Not about turning off your brain. Last myth is, okay, I'm doing it. I've done it three times this week. I've done it for a month. Maybe I've done it for six months, but it's so hard to keep going, like that whole workout thing. So there's a lot of things you can do. And by the way, I just, I'm not competitive at all, but this is old. I've actually meditated. This is my metrics on Insight Timer. I'm at 380 consecutive days. Yes! So this is how I do it. Metrics, you know, you've got your Fitbit, you've got your steps in, whatever your metrics are, if that appeals to you, then use that for your meditation. And there's all kinds of apps to help you do that. I am not gonna miss 380 days. That's gonna put me back to one. That's not gonna work for me. Or gamify it, reward yourself. You know, there's all kinds of reward programs and apps that, you know, you get gold stars and you get this. If that helps you out, then gamify it. Um, I really like this one, and I'll be honest with you, I have been known to text people that I've only met once to ask if they are where they are in their 10-day run of doing 10 minutes for 10 days. Find an accountability buddy. Text them, but find someone to just say, hey, did you meditate today? Andrew, did you meditate today? I did. You did, awesome. You can join a meditation group or meet up. But just remember, you can always do it anywhere, anytime. And if you miss or you, you know, ruin your run, your streak, you can always start again. All right, just I want to do a quick little shout out to this book. It's called the ZBA, the Zen of Business Administration. This is what was my door opener to modern mindfulness. I didn't know what mindfulness was. I didn't meditate, even though I was doing Shavasta. I didn't know it was meditation. I was in a bookstore, I picked up this book, and it's written by Mark Lesser. He was the CEO of his own multi-million dollar company and a Zen Buddhist priest, and he talked about how to marry business and mindfulness and meditation. Wow, blew my mind. Blew my mind so much that Mark Lesser is the CEO of a program at Google called Search Inside Yourself Leadership Institute, and I'm flying there tomorrow to enter their teener, teacher training program. So from that book and that bookstore to my next career, going to San Francisco, 
Thank you, Mark. Um, all right. Do you guys want to do one more little exercise? Do you mind? There's quite a few people in the room. So here's what I want you to do. It's really, really simple. It's going to take two minutes. I want you to think of a word. A word that represents either your personal brand or your professional brand, if you're not comfortable doing it. And it can be anything. And then I want you to, well, if we had a pen and paper, we'd write the word down, right? I'll just give you my word. My word is integrity. Now, I want you to take that word, and I want you to turn to someone you don't know sitting by you and tell them your word. I want you to own it, and I want you to just tell them why that's your word, and you can do this in 20 seconds, 30 seconds. But talk amongst yourselves. Integrity. Oh, we got a few more minutes. Okay, guys. So just bringing our focus back to the attention of mindfulness. Um, I don't know how that felt for you, but stating your brand, your personal branding, or this is what I call it because we're talking in a business setting, it's, it's an intention. You basically set an intention. And how does it feel to state an intention and then tell somebody about it? I think it feels pretty good. That's a mindfulness practice. Okay, you guys owned it, thanks. All right, a little bit about the science behind mindfulness because, you know, mindfulness has a PR program, a PR program, has a bad PR rap. And meditation and mindfulness, you know, I used to work in the wine business and people would say, ooh, wine, I wanna talk about wine. This is my favorite wine. I wanna to go to wine country. I love Sonoma, where do you stay? It was like a conversation you know, starter galore. Now I say, oh, I teach mindfulness and mo emotional intelligence. And this is what I get. <laughs> really? Because they're like looking at me going, ooh, does she have a cushion? Does she have a tattoo? Does she chant? You know, patchouli? I mean, I don't want to offend anybody, but you know, all that stuff that goes with the PR woo woo ness of mindfulness. So that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, let's talk about the science. There are so many studies, and I don't know, it's in pop culture and it's everywhere, it's almost too much, but I just want to share a couple with you really quick. The de facto study that kind of brought mindfulness back to the mainstream was in about 2011, and it was at Harvard. We like Harvard. And here's what they did they took a group of eight people, people just like you, who had either never meditated, who had never meditated before. I'll just say for the study, they had never meditated. They spent a half a day with them and they taught them to meditate. A little focused breathing, maybe some visualizations, not a big deal. And then for the next week, eight weeks, they took them through a course where they meditated in a, you know, in the, as part of the study. So they knew they were meditating for about 10 to 15 minutes. And here's what they did, and this speaks to me they took a scan of their brain before the eight weeks and they took a scan of their brain after the eight weeks and here's what they found you can train your brain through mindfulness and meditation techniques the part of the brain that was responsible for self-expression and compassion and empathy that gray matter it grew it expanded and the part of the brain that you know was anxious and depressed it actually shrank so that was kind of the first study that hit hit the hit the press and everyone went, whoa what, what is this okay this is science this isn't you know some guru talking to me and then another piece of science i love to talk about although it's a love hate relationship i came up through the work wor through the work world in the 80s and if you weren't multitasking and working hard and working it you, you just weren't doing it but let's just talk about multitasking well guess what it turns out the brain doesn't work well as we multitask. So you're on your email, you're, you're, you're on your email, right? Checking your email while you're on a conference call, while you're tweeting, and while you're you know looking up what you're gonna cook for dinner or whatever. The brain doesn't work that way. Or whatever, you know, when, when's it Miller time or whatever. The brain does not work that way. So, you know, we have consequences. Basically, you get stressed out every time you switch focus. You make mistakes, okay? And um, I always forget the last one. You get stressed out, you make mistakes, and it just takes longer to do the task. So multitasking is not a good thing. Anyway, just take that information at your will. But there's a science to prove to back it up. All right, so let's get to the good part finally. What's in it for you? I don't know about you, I love this cartoon. You've probably seen it before, but I'd rather be the 
the being on the right, that's the dog. <laughs> if anybody's ever had a dog, they can teach you a lot about being Zen and being mindful. So again, a lot of science to back this up, but we're just gonna run through some, some really cool byproducts of mindfulness and meditation. And I'm gonna personalize this because I've been meditating for about two years now. And the first thing I noticed right away, two weeks into it, I was way less reactive. I mean, I'm a type A kind of potty mouth kind of girl. And I'm just gonna tell you, you know, the classic is you're on the freeway or on the highway and someone cuts you off. And I mean, I'm that person who's gonna, you know, at least think about it, if not, flip you the bird. So just being less reactive. And just think about that, less reactive in conversations at work, maybe with someone difficult, maybe with your mother-in-law, your interpersonal relationships. I'm telling you, this is worth the price of meditating, which is, by the way, zero, costs you nothing to do it. So less reactive. Manage stress, everyone knows about this one. So I'm not gonna make a comment on how much stress you may or may not have in your lives, but we know that stress leads to, leads to a lot of bad things in our society, chronic illness, depression, just feeling bad. Um, meditating and having mindfulness in your life will reduce your stress. I'm gonna make that guarantee. More resilience. Now this is a little bit harder to measure scientifically, but I don't know if you know who this is. This is Sarah Blakely, the CEO of Spanx. She was turned down by about 100 people with her panty, basically alternative um, shapewear pantyhose line. Mostly well, those 100 people were dudes. They were men. And she kept going. And of course now she is the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company. She gets to hang out with Sir Richard Branston. And you know, resilience. She's a big meditator. And then this one needs really no explanation, but I'm kinder. Ask my husband of 30 plus years. I am 50% kinder. I don't know what that means that I was before, but I will take that statistics to the marriage bank all day long, or the relationship bank, or the work bank, whatever bank you want to put your mindfulness credits in. So anyway, all right, a little bit more about business and culture. Let's look at the numbers just to give you a perspective of where we are in terms of um, mindfulness and meditation. So something we know about is the yoga industry. The yoga's been around, I think, probably 15 plus years. It's become popular um, in the West. And that's a $16 billion industry compared with the modern mindfulness business to business industry. So I just want to give you that number to look at. Approximately 36 million Americans or 15% of the population practice yoga. Again, I'm a yogi, so that seems a little low, but okay, I accept that. Um, and only 18 million people are currently doing some type of meditation, mindfulness, emotional intelligence, professional development. So, you know what, we only have to go up from here. And again, if I can open the door to any of you to maybe step through and see how this is a business tool, let's, um, you know, let's work on that statistic. So just a couple of quotes from uh, people that I admire in business, or they just said a really good quote. <laughs> Ariana Huffington, you know, she's out of the media business and into the mindfulness business now. She specifically talks about sleep with her new company called Thrive. Stress reduction and mindfulness doesn't just make us happier, they're a proven business advantage. Okay, Huffington Post, I'll take that. This is where it really hits home in terms of business, and I don't know if you've seen the statistic, but stress, we'll just talk about stress, not anxiety, depression, any of the other negatives, costs the US business economy $300 billion, $300 billion. And that's, you know, healthcare costs, absenteeism, turnover, getting hurt on the job, accidents, and just generally not liking what you're doing every day. And that's money that nobody ever gets back. The good news is that as of now, about 40%, now this number seems high, but I'm loving it, 40% of US businesses are, are saying, yeah, we're promoting some type of professional development, mindfulness, emotional intelligence, leadership. So it's on the rise. So we're, we're all in this together. Um, the first CEO of Twitter, I think he said it beautifully, meditation is not just a nice a perk that makes this a nice fluffy place to work. It makes you better. 
it makes the company better, and we really believe in the hard science of it. I just went to a talk about company culture, and you know that's a whole other product, but if people are aligned and you know they're happy at work and they're, they're co-collaborating together and co-creating, it's just a much better place to be. So here's some more practical problems, and I just saw these stats last night, and I was like floored by them. I don't know if there's any um, managers or team leaders in the audience, but apparently you're unable to focus and be attentive 70% of the time in meetings. That's stunning. This one's not so stunning. Our minds wander 47% of the time. So half the time you haven't been listening to a word I've said. That's okay. <laughs> but here's the flip side. Of all of us in the room, and I think we are actually the anomaly, only 2% of us are making time for some type of professional development growth, i.e. meditating or mindfulness. So I just wanted that to sink in a little bit. And here's the last slide that I'm going to make on the case of adopting mindfulness and meditation. And we go back to Harvard. The main business case for meditation is if that you are fully present on the job, you will be more effective as a leader. Maybe you'll listen more. You will make better decisions. Maybe you'll multitask less. And you will work better with other people. Yes! Okay. All right, we're almost done. Pop quiz time. I don't know if you recognize this uh, character, but she was my first mindfulness teacher, and I'm going to guess your first mindfulness teacher. Who is this? Linda. Yep. And what did she say at the end of that movie to Dorothy? You always had the power, my dear. You just needed to discover it for yourself. She is my number one mindfulness badass. Thank you, Glenda. <laughs> All right, um, just a couple of resources for you, and I'm happy to send this to anyone. Who doesn't love a meditation app? Anybody here use any type of meditation app or tool? And when I say use it, I don't mean just download it <laughs> and look at it. All right, so two quick things. I always recommend Headspace to anyone who's just getting into it. 10 minutes for 10 days. If you can do that, get back to me, tell you how you feel. You do it for free. And then my favorite app is Insight Timer, and it's just really big and robust. And if you don't know about it, check it out. You want to do some recommended reading. These first three books are really very business focused. And um, you want to dive into the brain and emotional intelligence, and you're you know an engineer or, or someone like that, then the latter two. <coughs> Ton more resources. There are magazines and seminars and training programs, and these are sort of the top three. Um, University of Massachusetts, UCLA, and where I'm going tomorrow, search inside yourself at Google. I'm pretty excited. Um, so anyone meditation curious yet? All right, I have one last thing. Can you guys bear with me for 90 more seconds and let's do just a really quick meditation together? Let's do this. But let's don't do it with me. Let's do it with my friends Andy Puttacombe of Headspace and Jimmy Kimmel. Did anyone see this? Around the world, everyone, there's going to be people in bars right now meditating. It's <laughs> fantastic. Okay, just do what they do. I'm going to do it with you. Do you want to come sit here? Yeah, yeah. I'll sit next And if you are watching in a bar, I'd recommend you put your glass down. Yes, of course, yeah. Uh, yeah. Make, make yourself comfortable. You dim the lights a little bit. So look, we're not going to... Uh, I would always encourage people who haven't done any meditation, sit comfy on a chair, you don't need to sit cross-legged on the floor. Yeah. And whatever you do, don't try and stop your thoughts. Don't stop your thoughts. Don't. I think the, the classic mistake is to try and stop your thoughts. Just okay. allow thoughts to come and go. Yeah. Okay. So take a moment to get comfortable. Now, am I comfortable or are you comfortable? Doing it? I, I mean, it'd be nice if we were both comfortable. Am I too comfortable because I lean back? No, I think it's good. Yeah. It's good. Whatever works for you. I'm I mean, comfortable. Don't, don't go right back. But just, okay, just right there. You're too many thoughts. <laughs> Let the thoughts happen. Okay, I'm comfortable. Okay. So all of you sort of sitting, sitting out there, just take a, take a moment. And I'd like you to start off actually with your eyes, eyes open. Don't close your eyes straight away. Just a really soft focus with the eyes. And just take a big deep breath, breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth. And as you breathe out through the mouth, just gently closing the eyes. And just take a moment before you do anything else, just to enjoy that feeling of having nothing to do, nowhere to go, nothing to check. Just taking a moment to pause. 
as you pause, just feel the contact, the, the pressure of your body against the seat beneath you, the feet on the floor, and the hands and the arms just resting on the legs. And as you sit there, just beginning to notice the breath, the way the body is breathing, the rising and falling sensation. If you can't feel anything, you can just gently place your hand on your stomach. You're just feeling that movement. Again, allowing thoughts to come and go. The only thing you need to do is to realize when the mind's wandered and gently bring it back to the breath again. <coughs> And then just gently bringing the attention back to your body, back to that feeling of contact on the chair, the space around you. And when you're ready, you can just gently open your eyes again. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing that. National television, talk about mainstream. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So I just took your picture. I just want you to know it's for my own personal use. No, I'm going to take it to Google and show them what I did today. Maybe it'll give me a leg up. Anyway, um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I'm happy for you to reach out to me about any questions. Uh, I just have to do a plug. I've started a meditation meetup around the fountains of Kansas City. I thought that would be kind of cool to go to some of the bigger well-known fountains and just as a group try to do a little meditation to the, to the sounds of the fountains. So look for that. You can find me on Modern Mindfulness for Busy People Meetup. And I thank you for your time and attention. And I hope you go off with intention today and that you meditate well. Thank you. Thanks guys, you were great. Okay. Even you three, yeah. Books. Yeah, absolutely. And I have a hundred more books. Okay. But I, I love the books. Yeah. But these are awesome. That mindful work really will make the connection between work, work life and mindful life. He does a beautiful job.